Now, if I just had a beard, then. First of all, I'd like to thank John Topping and the Climate Institute and the work that Rachel did to make this a tremendous event. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, kind of a paraphrase uh, of how things change uh, from Margaret Mead. It doesn't change with this large groundswell, it changes with a small group of dedicated people. So uh, in this audience, uh, I see the uh, harbingers of change. Um, I was head of a large NOAA research laboratory uh, and uh, about 25 years ago I was sitting in uh, Vice President Al Gore's office with Jim Baker who's in the audience and we were talking about how bad the uh, effects of climate change were going to be and we've lost those 25 years. What we have today is a real solution that works now. It's not technology for the future, it would work now. What we're missing is leadership and understanding. And uh, about uh, 10 years ago when I was head of that research laboratory, uh, the numbers kept looking worse and worse. Uh, we really were not doing anything. Year after year of these 25 years, uh, the numbers go up on the amount of carbon dioxide being released and the projections for the future. So I decided to work instead rather on what the problem is going to be to work on a solution. And since I had spent my entire life in weather, I understood something that isn't super easy to convey, but I hope you all walk out of here with an understanding. Basically, AC power is local you can't get it very far. It's not just losses, it's also reactive power. Uh, it's also keeping it synced uh, for AC. So if you want to be able to have a large area where you can move power, or energy rather really, uh, from areas where the wind is blowing or the sun is shining or where it's needed, uh, you really need a technological capability that exists, the high voltage direct current network. So what I've said is, we're really at a point uh, that we need leadership. Have we had leadership in the past? Uh, indeed we have. There's a wonderful scene in the uh, Nothing Like It in the World, Stephen Ambrose's book about the transcontinental railroads where President Lincoln says, we need to bring this continent together and we need the transcontinental railroads. That's basically the 19th century. Uh, then there's President Eisenhower who led us in World War II uh, at D-Day. Uh, President Eisenhower basically had the same vision that for commercial and military reasons, we had to have a super network of highways, our interstate highways. And uh, the, la the uh, bill itself, uh, which uh, uh, Al Gore's father played a big role in, uh, was called the Commercial and Military uh, Interstate Highway Network. We are at that juncture again. We're in another century. The challenges are different, but we must rise to meet those challenges. What are the challenges? Well, the way I like to say it is there's two huge challenges and there's uh, a big opportunity. The challenge is this. This was done at my lab at Boulder, Colorado by D uh, Dr. Peter Tans. Uh, essentially, uh, our current plans, uh, I also was at uh, Paris and uh, I wasn't one of the negotiators, but I worked with the uh, US team there. And I think everybody understood that we had to take a first step. The Chinese say a journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. But our current direction, the most realistic estimates, take us to a, a peak in emissions at 2050. So anytime somebody says to you, oh, well, uh, we've got you know, uh, 20 years by 2040, we'll be down to this. Uh, they're usually talking about the U.S., they're not talking about globally. And right now, there is no credible effort worldwide that legitimately is going to reach this point. Uh, there are commitments uh, which are fairly 
um, as much as we could get at Paris. Uh, but this is essentially where we're going and what we get. So what we see here on this graph is how much the dark line is how much we're emitting, which ends up being uh, a lot because as soon as you reach the peak, you still have to bring it back down. And the total uh, concentration of CO2, according to Dr. Tan's calculation, ends up at about 740 or 750 parts per million. We have not seen that since the Eocene. At the time we were at 750 parts per million, there was no ice in Antarctica, no ice in Greenland. That's a 230 foot sea level rise if that happened again. Fortunately, it takes a long time for ice to melt when it's a giant ice sheet. But the one thing I've learned in 40 years of looking at the geophysical system that we know as Earth is that it has big surprises and it can move a lot faster uh, than you might think. The second problem that we have is a vulnerable electric system. Look at Puerto Rico today. Uh, think about our electric system. Uh, those of you who've read Ted Koppel's book realize there's very large threats due to cyber attacks, uh, but there's also solar storms. Uh, we really have a, a threat of a solar storm, uh, the one in thousand year solar storm on average happens once a century. So in this century, we could have a solar storm that brought down the electric systems, not just of the US, uh, but electric systems around the world. Uh, we have an immediate threat. Um, the, uh, some uh, people believe that the uh, so-called hydrogen bomb that Kim Jong-un tested uh, a year and a half ago really was designed to be a giant uh, electromagnetic pulse bomb, which, uh, at very high um, exposure rates can totally destroy a large area of an electric system. The bigger the area, the harder it is to come back. So if you uh, get a small area, we dealt with Hurricane Katrina, uh, able to bring in stuff from the outside. We're having a tough time with Puerto Rico, uh, but some of these large EMP blasts done in space uh, could take out a very large area of the United States for electricity for months and months. And think about uh, no gas stations, their pumps don't work, supermarkets run out of food in a few days, you don't have pure water. Think about a world where people are jammed together tightly as we are in our current population. I think the biggest key to why we're in this situation is we have not dealt with the centrality of electricity power to our livelihood. Uh, we see planes go down occasionally and the FAA requires uh, all these uh, really uh, redundant, uh, super um, uh, good systems to keep those planes in the air. Here we are with our electric system, which is crucial to all of us uh, and our families living and we haven't had the same attitude of requiring huge safety. So these are two great problems. And I said something about an opportunity. What is an opportunity? An opportunity is uh, this idea of a national grid of high voltage direct current lines basically would say that not only the building of this line itself, but our energy sources, instead of coming from places like Venezuela, uh, Iraq, Russia, our energy sources would be internal. It means something on the order, we did some uh, fairly crude calculations, but it's something on the order of seven million permanent jobs that are now elsewhere to build and maintain a system like this. So this is the idea an interstate, a network, and you say, well, China's doing it, Europe's doing it. Not really. What they're doing is point-to-point -point lines. They've got a wind farm here, uh, they uh, bring it to another point, and a network is way different. Uh, so when I say we have a solution, I'm really saying 
Uh, this solution is similar to what we learned in the 19th century with railroads, what we learned in the 20th century with interstates. That is, when you have a network, you can move energy or whatever the commodity is from any point to any other point, and you can build it robustly. The idea here is we have enough engineering talent to build a really solid system. So here's my test question. We're at a university, and you're all going to be graded. Uh, so the test question is, arrange the following electric energy generators in order from the cheapest to the most expensive. Wind farms, solar plants, natural gas, coal plants. This is using uh, the latest estimates. The answer is the cheapest right now is wind farms. The most expensive right now is coal plants. That's a very new development. What has happened, and this is from a study by Lazard, uh, which you can have a look at. I'm putting it up on the screen, although uh, I'm not sure everybody can, can read this all, but it basically says uh, what the levelized, unsubsidized costs of energy are right now. This is a very exciting thing, but the fact is wind and solar are never going to take much of the market. And that was what I did our study on at the NOAA Research Lab. The problem is wind is not where uh, the people are. You've got tremendous wind resources. The areas of high wind resources are those red areas in the center of the country. Uh, the east and the west are pretty blue. Uh, obviously, in the oceans and the Great Lakes, you've got quite a bit of wind. But the basic thing is you've got to move it in real time. If you put up your uh, wind uh, generator in North Dakota, you can uh, deliver wind at 2.8 cents a kilowatt hour, but you don't have a market. That is why the only solution right now is being able to move the energy in real time. So how did this happen? Did we just do it? Actually, I put together a group. I told them I thought we could do it in six months. It took us six years. Every time we submitted to science or somebody else, they said, well, you got to cover this. Uh, in the end, I'm very proud of this. It was ranked third out of uh, 1,600 papers by Nature uh, in terms of public impact by Altometric. Uh, it basically showed that if you can move energy around in real time, wind and solar energy will do very well. So we're looking here at a real-time display of wind and solar energy. You can see the sun go by and uh, you can see the wind. The key point is that uh, it's going to come from different places at different time, but if you can move it in real time, you can have inexpensive energy. So this was a minimization, an optimization. Here's a picture of where you put the resources. You've got the green areas, which are wind farms. You've got the black lines, which are the transmission lines. It's hard to see, but there's some red things in there, which are the solar plants. This system delivered the following. It delivered, um, we're comparing it kind of with uh, 2000 and, um, 2012. Uh, at that time, it was close to 10 cents a kilowatt hour, and we were putting out 2,100 uh, billion tons of, of carbon dioxide. The plans with the clean uh, power plan that uh, the U.S. put out is we'd be able to lower that a little. If we go through a national market and you basically build the lowest cost energy sources, you're going to get about 55% wind and solar. You'll reduce our CO2 emissions by 80%, and the costs will still be up around 10 cents a kilowatt hour. How should we build it? Well, um, the key thing that I want to say is we have enough knowledge to build an electric system that is very robust. It's sort of like uh, if you have this network, you design it. One way to get robustness is to put it underground. It has some advantages. 
but uh, there are a technology that's developed over a period of time, uh, both above ground and below ground, high voltage DC. I wouldn't pretend to design it on the fly. That thing that I showed you is a hypothetical network along uh, interstate highway lines. Uh, but um, the um, uh, key here is you've got cyber threats. Uh, you have uh, right-of-way problems. You have to put it places, if you do underground, you've got to put it in places where you can uh, uh, have the right soils. If you do overground, you've got to figure out a way to protect it from things like EMP and solar storms. Uh, if I was a Department of Energy, I'd ask them to design this system and uh, uh, design one that's really going to be safe against the obvious threats of the 21st century. This is an example of uh, in Australia, they're putting an underground line um, uh, in. It's uh, several companies. The US has a factory uh, that I think has been repurposed uh, now to, to AC, but it's uh, a factory in uh, North Carolina. Uh, the real key here is this is not just what we need to do to protect our people from climate change, to protect us from the horrendous possibilities of uh, loss of the electric system. You know, Puerto Rico is just really a teeny preview of that. Uh, it, the real deal is that by making our energy uh, mainly an internal good, uh, we also uh, have less uh, sort of incentive to go uh, to the Middle East with all of our troops to, uh, uh, in, in essence, be offshoring a lot of the best jobs associated with the energy system. So um, the underground idea, uh, I think, um, is more costly. Uh, it might be a factor of three. But that factor of three would add about a penny to your electric bill. So instead of 10 cents, it would be 11 cents. So um, the idea of an underground supergrid, uh, at least in part, is something that I've thought is important. We do more than just use electricity for um, toasters. We also drive. And uh, there have been very rapid switches in other parts of the economy. Here's a picture from. Easter Parade 1900, where it's all horse and buggies except for one auto, and then 13 years later, all autos. We need to convert our transportation sector, our space heating sectors, our electric sectors. So uh, summary is this. We have a history of dealing with very difficult situations in the United States. We have an answer that works now, a technology that works now to solve these problems. All we need are leadership to solve them. Thank you. Good job.